Every programming language ships with a bunch of primitive types, and they're nearly always the same ones, the same building blocks. You've got int and float, boolean, struct or record, and then char, and provided your language was written after about 1995, string. Here's a rare primitive to add to that collection, sound. This week we're going to look at a programming language where the most important built-in type is audio. The language is called Faust, and it's been designed for writing audio processing programs like digital instruments, software instruments, sound effect generators. And the language that comes out of that design requirement is a really curious one. It's kind of like functional programming meets music studio full of boxes and cables. And to talk us through what it is and how it works, we've got Faust developer, researcher, and educator, Romain Michon. He comes to us fresh from the National Centre for Music Creation in France. And he's going to take us through what Faust is and how it works. And I thought we'd spend this entire conversation talking about programming audio pipelines. But as we start to go down into it, we managed to go all the way down the stack right into programmable hardware. Because Faust is a language that compiles to C and compiles to Rust and JavaScript and WASM, and very soon to instructions that configure logic gates directly on a chip. We manage in this episode to go from functional programming right down to ones and zeros, with audio all the way through. That's quite a lot to cover, so let's get going. I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Developer Voices, and today's voice is Romain Michon. I'm joined today by Roman Michon. Roman, how are you? I'm doing great, Chris. And you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. You're looking relaxed after your vacation, which I've dragged you back from. Uh, yes, vacations were great. Uh, they were a little bit too short to my taste, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it, it is good to be back to work, though. Uh, oh, good, good. And work for you is working on this very curious language of Faust. Yes. So start there. What is Faust? What's the reason for another programming language? So Faust is a programming language for real-time signal processing applications. So uh, it means that uh, it's what we call a domain-specific language. So Faust is not general purpose. Faust was designed to do one kind of task, and it's real-time audio signal processing. Okay. So uh, let me think, What's, what makes that tricky? Real time is the thing that makes that difficult, I assume. Yes. So, uh, so the reason why FALS was created uh, was to provide a higher level way uh, to deal with audio programming for real time applications. So if you want to uh, implement a uh, program that's doing real-time audio signal processing, in general, uh, you have to use uh, C or C++ or uh, Rust now, but basically you have to use compiled languages because only with this kind of program languages can you achieve uh, real-time performances that you need to do like low latency audio processing or things like this. So, so say you want to make an audio plugin or you want to make a standalone application for your desktop computer that's doing real-time audio processing, then you have to use uh, C, C++, or uh, Rust, which is kind of a new way of, uh, of doing this. But, but basically, you have to use compiled uh, programming languages. The problem with those languages, uh, as you probably know, is that they are hard to use, and they are not necessarily very accessible to uh, people who have a limited background in computer science. So the reason why FALS was created is to um, provide a solution to this problem. So uh, it's basically a higher level uh, programming paradigm but uh, providing the same kind of performances than the ones that you would have with a compiled language. Okay, so give me an example of someone. So someone who's writing, um, when I'm recording this podcast, sometimes I use software that removes the reverb from the room. Yeah. Right. Would it be someone who's writing that kind of application that's trying to 
detach reverb sounds from audio. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so there are many, many examples of uh, audio processing, uh, and uh, and as you say, right now there is probably a fair amount of audio processing happening in the background of this recording uh, to remove echo or to remove the natural reverberation of the room, or uh, to apply dynamic crunch compression. Uh, or uh, any kind of filtering, or even sound synthesis in some uh, in some cases. So, uh, so for example, if you want to do speech synthesis or things like this, you you have oh, to yeah. synthesize sound, and uh, and that's another uh, use case for uh, real time audio processing. Are we also talking things like synthesizers? Yes. So, uh, so if you have a synthesizer at home, like a, a keyboard synthesizer, where uh, when you press a key, uh, you get a sound. Uh, so, uh, so that's the kind of things that you can do with uh, with Faust. Yeah. Okay. So, is most of the users of Faust would be n- kind of programmers, but not like low level C engineering programmers, but maybe like hybrid programmers come music designers yeah so um that's uh that's a good question because usually uh when you work in a company that's uh making audio plugins for example or that's doing this kind of stuff mm. you have two kinds of uh engineers in the company working in this uh you have the the people who are developing the algorithms and uh, and who are uh, basically what we call dsp uh, engineers so uh, so they basically Work on the math that's um, that's uh, processing sound, right? Yeah. And uh, and then you have uh, the software programmers who basically take uh, what those people are doing and implementing it uh, so that it can work in real time uh, on a computer or a smartphone or something like this, right? And uh, and usually those two people uh, they don't use the same softwares to do this. So uh, so the DSP engineers uh, will use tools like MATLAB uh, or Python for uh, prototyping their algorithms, uh, and uh, and then uh, the software developers uh, who will implement uh, the, uh, the the finished product, they will use C C plus plus. Rust, um, JavaScript, maybe WebAssembly if you're using the web, uh, but uh, but you really sort of need these two steps basically in the in the process. So what what Faust is providing is uh, the same uh, level of accessibility than uh, you would get with Python or with MATLAB for DSP engineers, uh, but uh, you directly get uh, something which is lower level uh, when uh, you go to the implementation stage. And so, uh, so, so you get kind of the best of both worlds, in a way. Okay, right. So if we, if we count with a language that was both expressive for music specifically, but then compiled down to something that ran with the performance of C. That's yeah. where this is going. Yes. So one thing that I haven't said yet, uh, and which is very important to sort of get the global understanding of this, uh, is that Faust is what we call a transpiler. So basically, uh, it compiles code, which is written in Faust, uh, to lower level programming languages. So it means that what Faust does uh, is that uh, it generates uh, code in lower level languages. So basically, you write something in Faust and then uh, you can uh, export it to C, C++, uh, potentially Rust, as I said earlier, or WebAssembly, Java, JavaScript. Uh, there are a lot of targets for Faust. So, so basically, uh, you can export whatever you write in Faust to lower level programming languages. So, uh, so Faust itself doesn't necessarily uh, generate uh, binary code, but uh, but Faust will generate code in lower level programming languages uh, that themselves can generate binary code. Okay, so you yeah, so you use Faust to generate the C that you would then have an onboard compile step until it became the final product. Yeah. I, I want to explore the management of that because I know given that you export to so many languages, that must be a problem. But before we get there, you surprised me by saying Java. 
because I can yeah. see that this domain requires a compiled language, but I would have thought it also requires a language that doesn't use a garbage collector because you can't afford the pauses. Yeah, so, I mean, um, when uh, the Faust compiler was designed, it was really designed to be able to export to uh, different languages. So it's easy for us to add new backends to the Faust compiler. So... So it means that um, if a new language comes up, uh, it's not that complicated for us to provide support for this language, and uh, and so uh, so Java uh, was just added as a target for the Faust compiler at some point, uh, okay, <laughs> because someone probably asked for it, and um, and then from a practical standpoint. Uh, you know, exporting code to Java is actually not that different from exporting codes uh, to C++. You know, because like, uh, syntactically speaking, Java and C++ are not that different when it comes to uh, expressing a DSP algorithm. And uh, and so uh, so so the reason why we're supporting Java is because someone uh, asked for it at some point. But uh, but it's definitely not the most used uh, target. Uh, for uh, for Faust, you know, the, you know what? In fact, I think the latest version of the Faust compiler doesn't even have support for Java anymore. So, uh, so, so maybe okay. we should just forget about this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But you're kind of if you're doing JavaScript as well, that's the same thing, which WebAssembly doesn't have. So you're kind of saying we can support it easily enough. That may not be the best choice of runtime, but we can support it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if you want to get uh, the best performances uh, in terms of uh, runtime, uh, there are not that many options. That's that's what I said earlier. You know, like mm. so. So if you're using a web browser, uh, then you should use uh, WebAssembly, and uh, and then if you're uh, you, if you're using a desktop application. Uh, then uh, you should use any compiled language that exists, and there are not that many compiled languages that people <laughs> still use nowadays. You know, so so basically, your options are C, C plus plus, or uh, Rust, and uh, that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much it. So uh, I'm gonna have to ask because I know there's the language Zig, which was created almost by accident when the author was trying to create a an audio workstation. So do you support Zig yet? No, we uh, we uh, we don't. And to be honest, uh, I heard of uh, I heard of this language before, but uh, but I'm not really exactly sure uh, how it works or what it does. So uh, <laughs> so uh, so uh, yeah. Okay. Well, in that case, let's step back into Faust itself. How do you design a language suited for audio processing? How is it different? How does it look different? Okay, uh, that's a tough question, and, uh, and it probably deserves a very long uh, answer, So, which I'm going to try not to give. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try to make my answer as small as, uh, as possible. But, uh, so the, the first thing that you have to know about Faust uh, is that it's a functional programming language. Uh, so, uh, so it's not an imperative language, so it's very different... Um, than uh, C or C++, which are imperative languages. And uh, Rust is also an imperative language. So, uh, so Faust is very different in that, uh, in that regard. So um, another thing that I want to say is that Faust was created uh, originally by someone called Jan Orlare. Uh, and, uh, and Jan is still working actively on, uh, on, uh, on Faust. Uh, in, in fact, we're part of the same, uh, team here in Lyon. So, uh, so we, we do see each other quite, uh, quite often. Right. So, um, Jan uh, is someone uh, who's always been working on functional languages uh, and, uh, and someone who's also very much interested in the concepts behind uh, what we call Lambda Calculus. And okay, so, yeah. uh, so, uh, so basically, Jan tried to create um, uh, a program language uh, specifically designed for audio applications that combines uh, these principles. Okay, so, uh, so Faust uh, borrows principles from Lambda Calculus and uh, is very much a functional language. And the main conviction of Jan when he created the language uh, was that functional programming languages uh, provide a better um, 
paradigm for uh, coding audio algorithms. And uh, then imperative programming uh, then imperative programming languages and so uh, so the the part of the answer to your question is here you know like so uh, so Faust is functional and it's functional because uh, the creator of Faust uh, initially thought that um, uh, functional uh, programming languages are better programming languages for expressing audio DSP algorithms so why is that uh, so um, so you know, in the old days, uh, when uh, when people were uh, doing audio processing, uh, they were not necessarily using digital technology. They were using um, analog circuits, right? Right. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, you would connect uh, resistors and uh, transistors, and well, not necessarily transistors, but uh, capacitors and uh, and uh, different components together to uh, implement uh, a filter or a sound synthesizer or something like this, you know? And, uh, and so, uh, so uh, to express this, uh, you would draw a block diagram of your circuit, right? And, um, and so if you think of a block diagram of a circuit, um, in a way, uh, it's kind of closer to a functional programming paradigm uh, than an then what you would get with an imperative program language where operations happen sequentially, right? So, um, so basically, uh, Faust was designed with that in mind, you know, like, so, uh, so basically, uh, Faust is also, um, a programming language that we can see as a data flow programming language, you know, because uh, you basically connect yeah. a block to a block to a block, and by combining blocks together, then you can implement your uh, your algorithm. Uh, with imperative languages, uh, you don't really do that. Well, you can create a sort of data flow connections, but it's not as deeply embedded in the language as uh, with uh, with Faust, basically. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so I don't know if that completely answers your question, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it gives me this sense that, like, we're instead of iterating over byte arrays and then calling the next function in the chain with a chunk of bytes, you're doing a more kind of um, map stream processing style programming. So Faust. Uh, as a language is basically a language that allows you to build a block diagram, you know, and uh, and so uh, so basically when you write a Faust program, what do you what you do is that you uh, design a block diagram, and in fact it's so uh, embedded uh, in the uh, semantic of the language that uh, you can export a Faust uh, program, which is a a scripted uh, language, right? You can export it to a block diagram, and, uh, okay. and so if you use the the Faust uh, web ID, uh, which you can find at faustid.gram.fr, uh, when you write uh, your uh, Faust program, uh, at the bottom of the page, uh, you can automatically see the corresponding block diagram to the the program that you're writing. So. So there is always a graphical correspondence to um, what you're writing in Faust, basically, and uh, and so uh, so so I think that's probably one of the biggest difference between Faust and uh, other languages that you might use for uh, audio processing. You know, like you uh, in Faust, you build a block diagram, and uh, and so so if you want to uh, create an audio process, you will connect uh, some kind of operation to another operation, and then to another operation, and then there is always a block diagram correspondence to to that. So it puts me a little bit in mind of. Um over architected guitar pedal boards we take yeah. the guitar into an echo into a compressor into, into whatever yeah that's yeah. exactly what you do so uh so uh and, and basically you know like in general when you uh implement audio dsp algorithms uh that's what you do you know like i mean a uh, uh, a filter is basically a combination of uh basic mathematical operations so addition subtractions uh sometimes multiplications and uh, delays basically, right? So, uh, so if you want to code a filter in Faust, uh, all you have to do is to uh, 
put together the right block diagram uh, combining uh, additions, subtractions, multiplications, and, and delays, basically. You know, like, and, uh... Yeah, because I guess in a way there's an analog there to like the physical circuits that we would do these things with, where your uh, capacitor introduces a delay, a yeah. resistor is like a multiplication or a division, and you can build these things up. Yeah, okay. absolutely, yeah. So does does this let me ask this does this just get used for music stuff or are there other kinds of audio signal processing in the world that I'm not aware of I mean um so I think it depends there are there are multiple answers to uh to to this question so um uh, traditionally, audio DSP has always been very much connected to uh, to music uh, because, uh, for some historical reasons, the people who worked uh, on music technology uh, during the second half of the 20th century uh, were also kind of the same people that developed all the audio digital audio infrastructure that we're using now uh, in computers, uh, in cars and speakers, technologies, or things like this. But, uh, music is not the only kind of application. And, uh, and so, uh, so it's always connected to sound, of course. Right. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but if you think about it, uh, we do have sound, uh, in our, uh, smartphones, uh, we do have sounds in our headphones, uh, we do have sound, uh, in our speakers, uh, and as you mentioned earlier, uh, when uh, we do uh, video uh, conferences like we're doing now, uh, we're also using sound, and uh, and there is obviously sound processing happening uh, right now as we're speaking uh, and uh, and doing this uh, video recording. So. Um, so basically, wherever you have sound, uh, you need some kind of processing. And so, uh, so Faust is not limited to musical applications, but, uh, but it can also be used for any kind of applications that require processing sound, which is basically everywhere around us nowadays. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I remember a few years back trying to work with the Objective C, uh, audio library for iOS. Yeah, and that was terribly low level, and it was basically a miserable experience. Yeah, yeah, I think we've um, all been through through that at some point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I'm sold on the idea of having something higher level. So um, that that makes me wonder: um, is this is is it as a, as a language? Is it memory safe? Is it type safe? Do you worry about those kinds of issues? Uh, not really because well it, it is very safe uh, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> saying that Faust is uh, is not safe uh, memory wise but uh, so um, type wise Faust only has one type uh, which is an audio signal so uh, so basically uh, the only thing that you can express in Faust is an audio signal then the Faust compiler uh, takes care of automatically deciding, at a lower level, what is going to be an int? What is going to be a float, or uh, you know, like th this kind of thing? So, so basically, Faust, uh, the Faust compiler automatically optimizes uh, what you write in Faust uh, to deliver uh, the most optimized uh, code in C, in C plus plus, or in any other programming languages. So. Um, so type-wise, uh, Faust is very safe uh, because it only has one uh, type, and memory management happens at a lower level. So, uh, okay. so, so basically, uh, again, the, the Faust compiler uh, is in charge of delivering, delivering the most optimized code uh, in C or in C++ or any language supported by Faust. And in theory, uh, the Faust compiler uh, never makes wrong decisions uh, as far as memory management is, uh, is concerned. You know? And so, uh, so, uh, so usually in Faust, you don't really have to worry about that kind of stuff. I suppose this is a unique case where you can do automatic memory management, not because you've got a garbage collector, but because you know that by the time you've passed the audio signal down the chain, you yeah. won't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like there, yeah. there is not really a need for a garbage collector in this case, you know, because like you, uh, you, and also, you know, uh, if you think about it, uh, if you're considering real time audio applications, 
everything is kind of running all the time, you know, and uh, and so uh, so like if you take again the the paradigm of an electronic uh, circuit, uh, so uh, so if you have something coming on the left side of your circuit, uh, there is always coming uh, there is always something coming out on the right side, and uh, whatever you have in between is always kind of uh, working. So. So in, in audio processing, uh, there are many, many, many cases where you don't necessarily need to do that much garbage collecting because uh, things are kind of always running all the time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got this live running process and then it's just stuff comes in and stuff gets shipped out. Yes, exactly, yeah. yeah. So I want to get into the architecture of how this is done under the hood, but that does bring up one more question. Is this quite... Do you have parallelization? Because it sounds like you ought to be able to parallelize this across multiple cores quite easily. Yeah, uh, well, uh, the answer is uh, it's kind of yes and no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, like the, the first thing that you have to consider is that usually for real-time audio processing, uh, people try not to uh, do too much parallelization or traditionally people didn't used to do that too much because uh, uh, it wasn't necessarily like super thread safe to do this for real-time audio applications. Again, like real-time audio is a very, very specific uh, case uh, in uh, in programming in general because uh, the real-time constraints are very, very, very high when you do uh, audio processing in real-time. Um hmm. You know, with uh, image uh, processing, or if you if you're doing like video processing or something like this, uh, you normally have to deliver a new image every thirty uh, well well thirty times per uh, per second, uh, sometimes sixty times per second. You know, like but but uh, the the real time constraints are not that high in that case, right? For audio processing uh, in real time, uh, you have to pretty much deliver a new sample every 48,000 times per second, you know? And, yeah. uh, and if you miss one sample, or if your sample is not delivered at the right time, if it's a little bit late, uh, then you will hear it. Uh, the, uh, the impact on sound is immediate, and people... Uh, People can hear it uh, very well, you know, and so uh, yeah, yeah. so when you do audio processing, uh, the the real time constraints are are very high, and uh, and so uh, so so that's why we use uh, low level programming languages in general uh, that compile directly to binary because uh, because of that. Uh, yeah. But um, I forgot what your question was. So I'm wondering if, because I've got this, uh, I've got this metaphor of like a pedal board for guitars. Yeah, you're plugging things into things. You've got a pipeline. How hard is it to take one of those pedals and put it on a different CPU? Oh yeah. So, sorry. Uh, now I remember your question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Faust can automatically parallelize uh, something that you will write in Faust. So, uh, so the Faust compiler comes uh, with uh, a series of uh, compilation flags that you can use and that allow you to configure various options uh, in terms of the code that's going to be generated by the Faust compiler. And, uh, and so one thing that you can do is that you can ask the Faust compiler to automatically vectorize uh, uh, the, the code that's generated by the Faust compiler and, uh, and to automatically parallelize uh, that code. And, um, okay. and so, uh, so this is something that was implemented in the Faust compiler about 10 years ago, and uh, it was kind of an experimental uh, thing. And, uh, and so uh, some, some people have been uh, trying to use that in various scenarios, uh, notably uh, trying to use uh, GPUs because uh, you can uh, obviously uh, parallelize things uh, heavily on a, on a GPU. But um, in practice, uh, this is not something that people have been using much, uh, like th that feature in Faust to automatically uh, parallelize the, the code uh, that's generated by the, the Faust uh, compiler. 
So, uh, so it's not something that's supported on the main branch of the language currently. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, as I was uh, trying to say earlier, uh, usually when you do real-time audio signal processing, uh, people don't do that much parallelization, you know, like, so, so typically what you will do uh, is that you're going to use a digital audio workstation and in that digital audio workstation, you're going to run multiple plugins in parallel. And uh, usually your DAW will try to run uh, a plugin on one core and then another plugin on another core. Uh, And, uh, but, Usually, it's not so common when you have one plugin uh, that's running different things on different cores, basically, because uh, right, it's not yeah. super thread safe to do that. And uh, and so uh, so typically, you will do this kind of patching directly in your digital audio workstation, uh, but it's not something that you necessarily want to try to do directly in the plugin that you're that you're writing. So. Uh, so, uh, so because of that, uh, that feature uh, in the Fels compiler that I just told you about was not necessarily used uh, that uh, much. Okay, so it's it's technically possible, but there's not much user demand for it because you tend to run one instrument per core. Yeah, usually that's that what you do. Sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think it's di- time to dive under the hood and see how this is actually architected. So I write some Faust code, which presumably is looking vaguely familiar as a kind of functional programming pipeline of interesting stuff and i give it to you you being the compiler in this case yeah what do you do with it next so uh the first thing that the false compiler uh is going to do is that uh it's going to sort of break down uh your uh false uh program to build a dsp graph out of it okay so basically okay. uh it takes the faust program and then it tries to build a flat uh block diagram uh of all the mathematical operations that are happening uh within your dsp code so in faust uh just like in many other programming languages uh you can use uh, libraries and uh, and so it means that not everything is uh written uh directly uh, in your Faust program, right? So, uh, yeah. so you can import libraries, and these libraries give you access to functions, and then you can call these functions uh, in the Faust uh, language. Uh, well, in the in the Faust program that you're uh, that you're writing, right? Uh, so, the first thing that the Faust compiler is going to do is that it's basically going to import all the functions that it needs uh, into one big file uh, to uh, have uh, basically an inline. Uh, Faust program with everything in it. Okay. Mm-hmm. After that step, uh, the Faust compiler will build the DSP graph that I just talked about. So basically, it's going to flatten everything, and uh, and it's going to construct uh, a tree, basically, right? Uh, okay. Where uh, you're going to have uh, an input at the top and the output at the bottom, uh, with all the mathematical operations uh, that you're going to need in between memory accesses and, uh, you know, like uh, everything that you need basically to implement your um, audio uh, DSP algorithm. Once uh, we reach that stage and th- we have access to this low-level representation of your DSP algorithm, uh, then uh, depending on what the user wanted, the Faust compiler will uh uh, generate uh, code in different programming languages uh, depending on uh, that uh, DSP graph that was just uh, built from your Faust uh, from your Faust uh, code, basically. Okay. Okay. And so, uh, so basically, after that, you say I want to generate C or C plus plus or WebAssembly or uh, any uh, backend, uh, any programming language that's supported by the Faust compiler. And the Faust compiler will do that from uh, that low-level representation of your DSP uh, tree, basically. Okay, so it's, it's very much like a lot of other languages where you, you parse it into what might be seen as an abstract syntax tree or might be seen as an abstract audio processing tree. Yeah. And then you've got a bunch of different read that low-level tree and turn it into C, C++. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. How modular is that, out of curiosity? Uh, sorry? How modular is that? How, like, 
do you need to hack the main code base if I wanted to add in Zig? Or would I just supply a program that is separate? Yeah, so, you know, audio DSP programs, uh, in the end, are not that complicated. Uh, you know, audio uh, DSP algorithms are, as I said earlier, they're basically just simple, basic mathematical operations, right? So, uh, so as long as you can do uh, math, you know, so like addition, subtractions, multiplications, divisions, um, trigonometric uh, operations, and uh, and then store things in memory, uh, then you can probably implement pretty much every audio algorithm that exists in the world, right? Okay. Uh, and so. Uh, so, um, so for that reason, then uh, exporting uh, that low-level uh, DSP uh, representation of your uh, audio DSP algorithm to another language is actually not that complicated, right? Uh, and so uh, all that to say that uh, if you want to add new uh, uh, backends to Faust, so if you want to provide support for other programming languages, then it's actually not that complicated because uh, what you generate in the end is not that different from one language to to another. Um, so there are a couple of uh, exceptions to that. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and so uh, so maybe I can talk about them because uh, they are potentially kind of uh, kind of interesting. So mm. so recently we uh, we've been working on a new project where uh, we try to use Faust uh, to uh, program FPGAs. Uh, so FPGAs are uh, field programmable gate arrays. Uh, and so, so for those of you who've never heard of FPGAs or, or heard of FPGAs but don't really know exactly what they are, um, so FPGAs are a very specific kind of uh, processor where uh, instead of having a static architecture for your processor, the way you program your processor is by reconfiguring uh, its internal electronic circuit. So basically, uh, with an FPGA to implement um, to implement a program, uh, what you do is that you uh, basically design your own processor in a way, right? So uh, so it means that FPGAs are uh, used to carry out only one task, and that's the task that they were programmed uh, for. Uh, and uh, and then, uh, as opposed to CPU, they are not uh, generic. Uh, they only do one thing, and that's the thing that you know, you you, impl- you implemented them for uh, that they are doing basically. So right. this is like um, I get a CPU from Intel, and I decide I wish it worked slightly differently. I can flash an FGPA to behave as my slightly different silicon architecture. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. So on an FPGA, uh, the kind of resources that you have access to are uh, logic gates, uh, block of RAM, uh, multiplicators, or things like this. So, so FPGAs are extremely low level uh, in nature, basically, right? Right. And so, so usually, if you want to program an FPGA, what you use is what we call a hardware description language. And uh, and so, uh, so hardware description languages are basically programming languages that allow you to describe the way your electronic circuit uh, is going to look like uh, once it's uh, uh, placed on the FPGA. Right. So, in right. a hardware description language, you say. I'm connecting this logic gate to this logic gate, uh, and uh, I'm taking this input, and this input is probably a stream of one and zero, and uh, and this is the kind of operations uh, that I'm trying to do on this stream of one and zeros, basically. So it's very, very, very low uh, level, and. Um, there are only uh, well, there are not that many hardware description languages uh, in the in the world, you know. And the, the two main ones are Verilog and uh, and VHDL, and uh, and so uh, so uh, so the goal of the project that I'm telling you about is that we're trying basically to generate a VHDL code or Verilog code directly from from Faust, okay, and. Um, it's really, really complicated. 
helmet. <laughs> okay. And it's really, really hard. And that's why I'm saying that uh, there are exceptions to what I told you earlier. You know, like, so, uh, so if you want to add a new backend for uh, a normal um, uh, standard language to Faust, it's easy. But if you want to add a backend for something that is as low level as uh, DHDL or Verilog, then it's potentially more complicated. And uh, and so uh, so we're we're kind of still struggling with this. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and so uh, so so it depends on the language that you're targeting, basically. Okay, I, I've got to ask about because I like this idea that I could write my dream synthesizer in Faust and then not just compile it to a running program, but actually burn it into hardware that was my hardware synth. Yeah. But why is I can see that it would be weird to describe it in terms of uh, logic gates, but why is it fundam Why is it much harder than describing it in terms of add operators? Uh, they are, uh, this also deserves a very long answer. <laughs> I'm sorry about this, but, um, okay. So the, the first thing that is hard is, uh, dealing with, um, fixed point arithmetic. So, uh, yeah, okay. so, so that's, uh, that's one, uh, primary, uh, difficulty when you, when you're doing this kind of stuff, cause, um, you know, usually when you do, uh, real time, audio signal processing and you want to express an audio DSP algorithm, you do want to have uh, floating points because, um, uh, you know, we're talking about signals. So we're talking about uh, potentially um, a variation in a voltage. You know, like if you think again about an analog circuit, uh, it's easy to be able to express uh, the kind of operations that you're going to carry out on those signals uh, using floating points point operations right uh, and uh, fixed point is complicated so in you know in the old days and even nowadays uh, there are uh, DSP engineers uh, that know how to write um, audio DSP uh, algorithms using fixed points and uh, and the reason for that is because there are still some uh, chips for audio signal processing, uh, like DSPs, so digital signal processors, uh, that only work in fixed points. And, uh, and usually those uh, chips are either cheap or uh, they're uh, optimized for um, uh, using as little energy as possible, right? And uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Because you know, like it's uh, it doesn't consume the same amount of energy to. Um, uh, to do floating point operations than fixed point operations, right? So, uh, so the the first answer to your question is this, basically, you know, and uh, and so in Faust you can express your audio DSP algorithm using floating points, of course, because well, and you don't even have to think about it uh, about them in terms of floating points, but you want to use decimal numbers, basically, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, so this is something that you can do in Faust and it's really much, it's very much part of the, the, the Faust syntax, you know, like being able to express decimal numbers, uh, on an FPGA, there is no such a thing as, uh, decimal numbers because it's very low level, you know, and, uh, yeah, you're, and you're literally you, down to the binary. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. and uh, and so when you're talking about logic gates, uh, of course, you're not talking about floating point numbers. So, uh, so it means that uh, uh, in order to generate VHDL code, uh, which is reasonably well optimized for an FPGA, uh, then uh, we have to support uh, the automatic conversion from floating points to fixed points directly internally within the Faust compiler, and this is something which is not simple to do. Um, yeah, I can see that being a chunk of extra work. So, so that's the that's the the first reason, and then uh, there's uh, many other reasons, and the other reasons are very much related to the kind of optimizations that you normally do when you use uh, an FPGA. Uh, so, when you use an FPGA, um, the typically uh, the two main kind of optimizations that you can do uh, when you're uh, designing your uh, electronic circuits uh, is to parallelize computation, right? Uh, which is not something that you can do 
that easily when you're using a CPU or a DSP. Uh, well, you can do it, but uh, but again, uh, it's not uh, necessarily designed for that. So you can do uh, heavy parallelization on an FPGA, which is not the case uh, with uh, other kinds of platforms. And then the other thing that you can do is what we call pipelining. And pipelining is basically when uh, you reuse resources that you're already allocated on your uh, FPGA to uh, carry out uh, the same task, but over and over again. So, so for example, say that in your uh, algorithm, uh, you have uh, a series of operations that are the same uh, and that you need to run multiple times in parallel. Okay, so uh, so if the clock of your FPGA is fast enough, then potentially you can reuse that chunk of operations multiple times to carry out the same operation. Okay, so uh, so say for example you have multiple filters running in parallel, and all these filters are the same. Okay, mm. so uh, so if time allows it, you can potentially reuse the same filter to compute uh, the, the, the result of all the other filters that are running in parallel. And, uh, and this is what we call pipelining. And, uh, and so, uh, so typically on an FPGA, if you want to get uh, good performances, you need to do parallelization and pipelining. And these kind of operations are absolutely not natural when you're dealing with a CPU. And, uh, <laughs> and so, uh, so it means that uh, the kind of optimizations that we normally do um, uh, in Faust uh, when we're targeting C, C++, or more standard program languages, those optimizations don't apply anymore uh, when we're targeting uh, VHDL or Verilog, and so uh, so uh, so this is why it's complicated. You know, like so so pipelining, parallelization, and uh, dealing with fixed point numbers uh, is uh, are the reasons why we're struggling supporting uh, those specific languages. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Does that mean you're like? You've got this intermediate representation. Does that mean you're going back earlier in the chain and say, "I've got the unoptimized version. We could optim, and there are now two code paths: optimize that tree towards traditional languages, or optimize the tree in another direction towards um, hardware." Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we can't really do that, and uh, we really, really hope we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but we can't, uh, and uh, and so um, so for that very specific project, uh, Jan uh, Orlared, the the guy who created Faust, uh, he's basically trying to rewrite the Faust compiler uh, because uh, that internal representation that we have is not necessarily compatible with all the things that I uh, just uh, mentioned. Right, and right, so yeah. uh, and again, you know, like this is a new kind of application because uh, people didn't use FPGAs for real-time audio applications until kind of recently. Uh, so, so this is kind of something, uh, something new in a way. And, uh, and so, uh, so we never really thought about this kind of applications, and we never really thought that way uh, in terms of uh, signal processing. You know? and, yeah. uh, and when you deal with FPGAs and when you deal with hardware description languages, um, in many respects, uh, you kind of have to forget everything that you know, uh, and it's very, very daunting as a software programmer. And uh, and so, uh, so in order to do this project, uh, we kind of all had to learn uh, how to deal with uh, hardware description languages, and uh, and uh, and it was really, really tough uh, for all of us. <laughs> I can uh, believe because uh, again, you know, like. You're as a software programmer, you're very tempted uh, to write software code for an FPGA, and uh, and this is something that's completely uh, possible in a way. You know, like because uh, uh, hardware description languages are high level enough so that uh, you can potentially write code that's going to look like C or C plus plus code, like very low C C code basically. But if you mm. try to do that, uh, then um, it's so unoptimized <laughs> that uh, there are very high chances that uh, your program is just not gonna 
not going to run, you know. And uh, yeah. and if you want your program to run, you have to carry out so many optimizations uh, that are so not natural for software uh, that uh, for all these reasons, uh, we kind of had to rewrite uh, part of the Faust compiler. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. It's kind of like, um, seems like as an industry, we spent maybe the 40s and 50s trying to hide away from the fact that we're dealing with logic gates. Yeah. And now you have no choice but to re-embrace that if you want to deal with this kind of hardware. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, in a way, uh, is what uh, the people who design the C or the C++ compiler are used to deal with, you know, because like, uh, at the very bottom, that's what's happening, right? Uh, yeah. But, uh, but you know, as a software programmer, uh, you kind of forget about all those things, you know, because... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And even the C people, they're like, maybe... Th- I- there are a lot of times they're thinking about turning it into machine code, not necessarily AND gates and yeah, not it's gates. True, yeah. right? That's right. Absolutely, yeah. It's actually quite breathtaking if you step back and think you're trying to go from abstract enough for a musician to write down to ones and zeros. Yeah. This is perhaps the broadest project we've ever covered. Yeah, and uh, again, for us, it's not easy. <laughs> it's <laughs> fair enough there are a lot of things to know uh for for sure you know and uh and so uh so just to uh sort of wrap up on this uh like we uh, so for uh writing uh faust programs and then running them on fpga currently the 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 approach that we're taking uh is to use this thing which is called high level synthesis uh Synthesis, not in the sense of sound synthesis. Um, in fact, uh, those two things are completely different. But, uh, okay. but um, yeah, like 20 or 30 years ago, uh, a group of people thought that maybe there is a way to program FPGAs using C or C++. You know, and uh, and so uh, so most FPGA vendors uh, provide what they call HLS, so high high-level synthesis tools, uh, which basically allow you to program FPGAs uh, using higher-level languages, uh, which are not uh, hardware description languages. And uh, and so those languages are typically C, C++, and in some cases, Python. Uh, MATLAB can be used in some cases as well. Really? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, but the problem is that... Uh, uh, you run into the same kind of issues than the one you run into when you're using hardware description languages, uh, which are dealing with uh, fixed points uh, operations, uh, pipelining, uh, and uh, heavy parallelization. And uh, and so it means that uh, you can't just take uh, C code and run it on an FPGA. Uh, you have to write a C code which is specifically designed for an FPGA. And that C code is probably going to use uh, pragmas, uh, which are provided by uh, the high-level synthesis tool to carry out the right optimizations for your code uh, to run. So, uh, so currently what we're uh, doing with Faust in this context, uh, because again, uh, generating the HDL code directly from Faust is complicated. Uh, so uh, a sort of alternative approach that we have been using so far and which is kind of working very well uh, is to use uh, those high-level synthesis tools uh, and to generate uh, C code from Faust uh, which is optimized for high-level synthesis, okay? So basically what we do is that oh. you write Faust programs, Faust generates a specific C code, which is uh, optimized for high-level synthesis. Then uh, we take the C code, put it uh, into the uh, HLS tool provided by uh, the FPGA vendor, and then you right. get um, an FPGA program, which is reasonably well optimized for an FPGA. It's probably not as good as uh, something uh, that would have been written by hand in VHDL or in Verilog, but it's good enough so that uh, it's still better than something that you would have done if you used a CPU, for example, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and if so, you can't make the journey in one step, then make it in two. 
Yeah, but doing yeah. that is hard anyway. Still, you know, because uh, it means that you have to deal. Uh, you still have to deal with pipelining uh, and uh, parallelization directly uh, in the fast compiler. Because uh, even though there are tools provided by HLS that um, facilitate uh, dealing with pipelining and parallelization, you still have to sort of. An, embed that directly in the code that's uh, generated by the fast compiler and uh, and it's not that easy so <laughs> right so do you think this will become elegant once Yan has got the next version out or is it always going to be thorny so that's a good question so uh, so we uh, we've been really uh, intrigued by uh, FPGAs uh, here in the team for uh, for uh, many years now because uh, they provide uh, much more computational power uh, than what you would get with a CPU and uh, and the performances uh, in all respects of FPGAs are better than the ones you get with a more traditional platform you know like so so for example audio latency is a big one uh, mm. and um, so FPGAs basically have almost no latency. Well, they, they, they do have a little bit of latency, but it's much, much, much smaller than what you would get with a, with a CPU. So, uh, so it means that the time it takes to get a, a sound in an FPGA and then out of an FPGA is very, very short uh, compared to what you get uh, with a CPU or a digital signal processor or any other kind of uh, processing system. Another reason for using FPGAs is that potentially if you want to run uh, audio DSP algorithms at a very high sampling rate, uh, say in the megahertz range, as opposed to the kilohertz range, uh, which is traditionally used, uh, you can do that with an FPGA. So, uh, so if you want to okay. run your audio DSP algorithm at 20 megahertz, uh, you can do it with an FPGA. And it's actually not that much more expensive, computationally speaking, uh, compared to uh, running it at a lower sampling rate. So that's curious. I've got to ask, is that because that can't just be for the extreme audiophiles who want the hardest, highest sample rate they can get. Is that for radio signal processing or something? So, um, you know, like... Uh, it's really for very niche and specific kind of applications, but um, but uh, say that for example, uh, you want to um, make a virtual analog electro, uh, sorry, a virtual analog uh, DSP algorithm. So so you want to uh, have a sound synthesizer uh, which behaves like an an analog electronic circuit uh, or um, a filter that behaves like uh, an analog electronic circuit. So, uh, so typically when you uh, try to do that in the DSP world, uh, you run into aliasing issues, right? Uh, because uh, of discontinuities you're going to potentially create in the signal, you know, and, uh, and so sharp changes in your signal will result into uh, aliasing, basically, right? So aliasing is something that, uh, as a DSP uh, engineer, you always have to deal with, right? And um, one way to... Uh, get rid of aliasing uh, is to increase the sampling rate, <laughs> you know, uh, because uh, if you increase the sampling rate, then you're pushing uh, what we call Nyquist frequency, which is the the highest frequency that you can sample with your uh, with your uh, uh, with your system, right? And uh, mm. and this is already something that's done uh, in the uh, audio industry. So uh, so typically, um, if you are a very fancy uh, audio uh, recording uh, studio, usually you will run uh, your audio DSP workstation at a much higher sampling rate than what your uh, ear can actually take right so uh so basically yeah because there's a hardware limitation in our heads right yeah like the hardware limitation in our head is uh that basically anything that's above 40 kilohertz in terms of sampling rates uh is kind of pointless for our 
years, right? Uh, but yeah. uh, but not for a liaison, right? And uh, and so uh, so uh, you always have the risk to get a liaison uh, if your sampling rate is not high enough, right? And so uh, so the best way to get rid of a liaison is to increase the the sampling rate. And uh, and even though usually audio DSP algorithms are optimized for not having a liaison, there is some audio DSP algorithms that do have a little bit of, L- of aliasing, right? And yeah. uh, virtual analog is typically uh, some of them, right? And so uh, so if you want to uh, not have aliasing, the only thing that you can do is to increase the, the, the sampling rate. And, uh, and there are some uh, digital uh, keyboards uh, that are available on the market that are taking advantage of this property of FPGAs. Uh, and, uh, and I'm thinking, for example, of the Novation Summit uh, keyboard. Uh, okay. The Novation Summit keyboard uh, uses an FPGA internally to run some of its oscillators, uh, which are digital oscillators uh, at 20 megahertz or something like this. And, uh, and the reason why they are doing this is to guarantee that their digital oscillators are completely aliasing free, basically. Right. So you've got a sample rate so high that it is almost identical to what nature would provide in an analog circuit. Yeah, pretty much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can see that, all see that arms re- race going through audio uh, audio worlds for decades. So, yeah. Yeah. Sense. And so uh, so for all these reasons, uh, FPGAs are uh, very uh, appealing, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, so this is why we really want to try to um, – uh, provide support for this kind of platform. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, currently the only way that we can do this uh, in a way that makes sense uh, is by using HLS. And uh, and maybe in the future, we'll be able to uh, provide support for uh, Verilog or DHDL. But currently, we still have to depend on uh, HLS uh, tools, which is not necessarily a good thing uh, because uh, these tools are proprietary uh, oh. and uh, and because they are provided by uh, FPGA uh, vendors and um, and uh, and they only work uh, with a specific brand of FPGA. So it means that uh, if you generate optimized C code with Faust. Um, for uh, an HLS tool, uh, it will only work well uh, with a specific brand of FPGA, uh, and so uh, right. so it means that if you want to support multiple brands of FPGA, say uh, Xilinx versus uh, Intel or you know like uh, things like this, uh, then you probably have to reinvent the wheel every time. Whereas uh, if you can generate VHDL code or very large code directly from Faust, then you don't have to worry about this uh, because um, VHDL code works the same way from one FPGA to another. And, um, and VHDL code works the same way from one brand of FPGA to another brand of FPGA. So, uh, uh, okay, okay. Is that because it's a long established standard rather than something that's been invented by the manufacturer? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, okay. and uh, and again, like, if you want to program an FPGA, then usually you want to use uh, those uh, hardware description languages, which are supposed to be generic and work the same way um, uh, across uh, FPGAs. So, uh, yeah. It's funny. There's a definite parallel here between this and like the the evolution of graphics cards, their dedicated hardware, their dedicated languages, yeah. so that people can call them from say, yeah, yeah, I can totally see that. Maybe we should zoom back out because we've been right down in the binary. If we zoom back out to the language itself, I'm just, it, it's so wide, right? The the From writing this high level functional-ish language to generate audio right down to burning a temporary piece of firmware. Now, I know you teach this stuff yeah. as part of your job. <laughs> how much of that do you dive into? And how do you teach people that aren't traditionally programmers how this thing works? 
uh, honestly, <laughs> I I don't like. Uh, I mean, uh, okay. it's. Uh, I mean, audio DSP itself is a very big field, you know, and um, and uh, even if you take uh, very good students, uh, like in. Uh, Top level universities or whatever. Usually, you can only scratch the surface of all the things that I talked about here. You know, because because uh, usually, uh, and also, you know, like uh, it's not necessarily the same students who are interested uh, in uh, compilation, designing programming languages, etc. Than the students who are interested in doing audio signal processing. Right? Uh, yeah. Usually, yeah. Uh, students who who are doing audio DSP are electrical engineering students uh, and uh, students who are interested in um, making compilers and uh, creating programming languages. And there are actually not that many students who are interested in that anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> usually those students are uh, computer science students, right? So um, when I uh, teach uh, those things, um, I very rarely, not to say never, teach them all together uh, in one big <laughs> class. You know, because like, uh, it's impossible. You know, and uh, and so uh, so I do teach classes uh, sometimes in computer science, and uh, and then we have to focus on uh, maybe like the the language design aspects uh, of things. You know, but uh, but uh, but it's very rare when you can combine all those things together as I just. Uh, as we as we do in Faust, basically, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, and so um, so yeah, I do teach classes where I use Faust as a tool for uh, teaching uh, signal processing, uh, audio signal processing, uh, but um, it's very rare when we uh, delve into uh, the details of how Faust uh, actually works, you know, because because uh, learning audio signal processing itself already takes a lot of time, and usually, uh, you know, like uh, this already targets students who are master students uh, in their last or you know like a uh, year before last year or something like this, you know, like you know, and so. Um, so uh, yeah, so the yeah the the audience for uh, the kind of things that we do is actually not that uh, broad. So <laughs> I can see that the, the, your students are going to be just in that stage of specialization, and what we've talked about probably covers four different career paths. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. so you know we we do have students uh, who end up working on those things, uh, but usually they're PhD students, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and there are students who basically have the time to learn all those extra things that they need to know to, to actually be able to do things like this, you know, like, but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, in the end, like, uh, it's really hard just to teach a class on something like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can totally believe, I guess possibly I'm, I'm going to guess that the way you do it is start by being hands-on because it's a terrifically hands-on language you can type some code and you can literally hear what the results are right yeah you know what's uh what's cool about faust is that uh it just works pretty much right away out of the box you know and uh, and with just one line of code uh written in a web browser uh you can actually get a sound you know and uh so um so i personally don't do that uh, because I don't necessarily have the time to do things like this, you know. Like, but uh, but I have some colleagues here uh, whose uh, job is to actually uh, do this in middle schools um, and uh, and uh, okay. in uh, in high schools, you know, because like, it's very much accessible to uh, middle school students, uh, even though they don't necessarily have any background in uh, in programming or even in audio signal processing. Of course, you know, like the 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 language is easy enough to learn uh, that uh, you can write uh, code for a simple musical instrument or uh, an audio effect processor uh, just with one or two lines of code and uh, so uh, th this takes me to uh, maybe uh, something uh, something else here so uh, a couple of years ago we had uh, we had a project called Amstramgram. 
uh, and the Amstram Gram. Okay. Yeah, and the goal <laughs> of Amstram Gram is basically to uh, teach um, uh, sciences uh, for middle school students through the programming of musical instruments, uh, which are programmable musical instruments. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, all right. So it's probably not going to be, uh, easy for those of you who are listening to this, you know, like, but for those of you who are <laughs> watching, I can actually show you this musical instrument that I'm talking about. And then I can describe it, uh, for okay. those of you who are listening. <laughs> The combination video podcast come radio podcast there we now go. So, emerges in full. So this is uh, oh, this okay. is the gramophone, and uh, and the gramophone basically looks like uh, a Bluetooth speaker in a way, right? It looks uh, like a jar of strawberry jam with knobs on. Yes, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then uh, you can just uh, put it in your hand like this. So there is there is a strap in the back, and the strap okay. allows you to hold the strawberry jam uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> jar uh, directly in your hand, uh, which gives you access to the different buttons and knobs which are placed on it. Okay. Okay. And so this <laughs> device is basically programmable in Faust. Uh, and it's battery powered, so it's completely standalone. And uh, and the, the battery can last for about twenty hours. So uh, so it means you can uh, you can jam with it for 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 quite a lot of time. Uh, right. Uh, and. Uh, and so, uh, so basically, that thing is programmable with Faust. And uh, and so, what those uh, uh, students do is that they they learn how to program those things to make a sound, and then to map the different sensors that you're going to have on this instrument to a given Faust uh, program. And so, there are physical sensors that are mounted on the body of the instrument. So you have knobs, potentiometers, and uh, and things like this. Uh, but there is also uh, motion sensors that are built in in these instruments. So, uh, so like accelerometers, gyroscope, uh, compass, and uh, etc. And uh, and all those sensors can be mapped to sound synthesis parameters. So, uh, so for example, say that uh, you want to run uh, a sine wave oscillator on this instrument, and you want. Yep. You want to map the frequency parameter of that sine wave oscillator uh, to the x axis of the accelerometer. Then it's very easy to do this. You only need one line of code in Faust to do that, and uh, and then you can export that instrument to uh, to the gramophone, which I'm holding in my hand, and then you can potentially control the the frequency using the x axis of the accelerometer, which would probably sound like uh, you know. Woo-hoo. Uh, depending on <laughs> yeah. uh, how you uh, uh, orient uh, the the gramophone in space, so uh, that sounds like it'd be an incredibly fun school lesson and an absolute din. Well, and a huge mess too, because uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, like you know, usually kids love this because uh, you know it's very uh, tangible in a way. You know, like you know, and. Uh, but like uh, when you have thirty uh, middle school students uh, uh, manipulating the frequency of a sine wave all together with those very loud speakers, uh, yeah. <laughs> like in the same room, uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's rough. Like uh, it's probably one of the reasons why I'm not the guy doing this. You know, like so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My sister-in-law is a teacher, and she's done harder things to try and get the kids inspired. But I don't envy the job at all. Oh yeah, no, no. I, I mean, I I totally respect it, you know, and uh, and I think it's great that there are uh, uh, colleagues uh, who are patient enough to do this, you know. Like, but uh, but like, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of uh, it's kind of crazy. So yeah. uh, all that to say that uh, if you want to learn Faust or if you want to use Faust, you don't have to be um, an expert in anything. You know, you can, uh, you can write very low level code if you want to, uh, if you're like a DSP engineer. Uh, but if you're a middle school student and uh, you just want to uh, use objects which are already implemented in Faust and then uh, map uh, them to the to potentiometers or things like this you know like then it's really really easy to do you know and uh and so uh so it's really open to a lot of people and not just experts 
Nice, nice. Okay, well, that that perhaps leads into the final question then for the audience of this podcast. If someone is an experienced programmer looking to experiment with this very unusual programming language in a new domain, where should we go first? Where do we start? I think the the first thing that you want to do is to visit the Faust website, which is uh, Faust. So F A U S T dot gram G R A M E dot F R. Uh, Link in and, the show notes. Yeah, and so uh, so on that website, uh, you'll get all the information to to get started uh, with Faust. Um, then, if you want to do something a little bit more uh, advanced, uh, so a couple of years ago with Jan, so the. The, the guy who created Faust, uh, we recorded um, we recorded uh, an online class uh, about Faust on the okay. Cadenze platform. Uh, Cadenze, which is spelled K A N D E N Z E, and okay. <laughs> uh, it's a platform based in in the US and uh, and uh, Stanford University. Uh, where I used to teach at the time uh, was collaborating with this platform uh, to do uh, yeah like online courses and uh, and so you, you can take an online course for free uh, on Faust uh, on this platform the, the the course is about five six years old now so it's starting to be a little bit uh, old but uh, but it's still fairly up to date so uh, so I think that's kind of the uh, the the next step after going on the Faust uh, website for learning Faust. Okay, start there, and then maybe in a few years' time, your uh, your unique physical hardware instrument will be used on the next Taylor Swift tour. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> who knows? That's where the real money is. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Well, if one of you knows Taylor Swift in person, and uh, you think she'd be interested <laughs> in collaborating with us, we're we're definitely. Uh, Open to suggestions. So uh, awesome, yeah. Taylor. I know you're a huge fan of the show, so get in touch. <laughs> but until then, <laughs> Roman, thanks very much. That was that was broader and more fascinating than I could have possibly guessed. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, and yeah, thanks for inviting me to this. That was super super fun. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Romain. So take a look in the show notes for all the links. We covered a lot of ground this week. I'll make sure the first link is to that Faust environment that runs in your browser, and you can literally go and code some audio pipelines right now. It's tremendous fun, and given that most of us work from home these days, you can play with it right now and program some weird noises and be sure that you won't bother anyone else in the office. So take five minutes to play. I've used it actually myself to program an echo effect for one of my synthesizers, and it was really easy. So give it a try. If you've enjoyed this episode, before you go, please do take a moment to like it, rate it, maybe share it with a friend. If you want to support future episodes of Developer Voices, consider signing up to our Patreon. And Taylor, I'm looking at you. I know you can afford it. As soon as you're off the Eras tour, I want you to sign up. And on that note, it's probably time to go. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins. This has been Developer Voices with Romain Michon. Thanks for listening.